This is uh, Matt Carter with Delaware T Squared Center. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome back to day two. And um, so this morning, uh, we're uh, we're really pleased to have Chuck Ingram from Slurry Pavers uh, talk to us about quality practices with uh, microsurfacing and chip seals, uh, and probably a, a few other things he'll sneak in along the way. So, um, you know, uh, Chuck has a, a, a pretty robust uh, uh, biography. Uh, he's, he's been in the pavement preservation industry for over 43 years. Uh, he started with slurry pavers in, in 1977 uh, and seen that evolve into a multifaceted company. Um, for the past 29 years, uh, Chuck's been in charge of business development for the company in the Mid-Atlantic region. Chuck's been actively involved with the International Slurry Surfacing Association, ISA, for over 20 years is currently vice president on the ICE Board of Directors. Uh, he's chair of quality education and training committee, as well as the chair of the Slurry Systems Workshop Committee. He's worked with Industry Relations Committee and was a subject matter expert for the ISA Federal Highway Administration sponsored web-based uh, training modules for slurry seal and microservicing, uh, which by the way, it, uh, was recorded and is still available. And I would recommend uh, going and looking that up if you haven't seen it. For the past several years, he's been an instructor for the Slurry System Certification Program for VDOT and South Carolina DOT, uh, has taken part in Everyday Counts training with Federal Highway and led, tra led training for the Asphalt Institute, World, Asphalt, World of Asphalt, and the National Center for Pavement Preservation. He's active with APWA, the Virginia Asphalt uh, Association, uh, the Virginia Transportation Construction Alliance, and the County Engineers Association of Mar Maryland. Chuck's married. He lives in Lynchburg, Virginia, and they have four daughters and four grandchildren. And that's only part of what you need to know about Chuck. So um, with that, I'll hand it over to you, Chuck. Thanks so much for joining us. Look forward to it. You bet, Matt and Matthew both. Uh, and thank you for that. I didn't know you were going to read the whole thing that I submitted. It was, uh, uh, they know more about me than most of my family does at this point. Um, but hi, uh, good morning. I am Chuck Ingram. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to be here. Uh, this morning, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the quality construction practices, best practices for microsurfacing and chip steel. Um, I, I may warn you, as Matt mentioned, I was one of the uh, uh, subject matter put together the uh, web based training for ISSA and FHWA uh, for microsurfacing. Each one of these presentations are taken from uh, partly taken from us that are each four hours long. So we're going to get into, jump into the deep end pretty quickly. So buckle up and, and, uh, and, and try to hang on. Um, before we get started, Matthew, we've got those couple of questions that we talked about, uh, a couple of polling questions that I was just curious uh, to see. Um, I'd like to start off in the classroom every time. Can't wait to get back in the classroom after the Zoom thing. Um, what experience do you guys have with both microsurfacing and chip seals? Uh, and I'll explain why I had the one to five years and five years or more. Okay. You know, this, this gives a, a good barometer of where we need to be patient wise. Let's uh, leave the poll open for just another maybe 10 seconds here. We've got. 70% voting, some more coming in. It's interesting to see and, and good to see, you know, that there's uh, people with not a whole lot of working knowledge about, uh, about these treatments. Hopefully you can walk away today with uh, a, a little bit of, a, of an understanding. And as Matt uh, just said, uh, uh, the web-based training is available on the uh, ISSA website. Uh, it'll direct you to the registration for it. You can really get into uh, in, in depth with it. And they do have a chip seal web-based training module as well. Okay, so poll is closed now, Chuck. Okay, well, very good. Uh, you know, I see we got a little bit of a, a, a majority, particularly with microsurfacing that uh, hasn't got any experience with it yet. 
Um, and that's good. That's good. You know, I, I, we can talk to that. Certainly uh, join in the chat room. Any, any questions that you have, and we'll take uh, the reason I talked to on both of these treatments for uh, one to five years with preventive maintenance treatments, you know, I'll often encourage people that, you know, that, to get into it and they do it a one time shot and jump into it for a year, maybe two years, think they've got a full opinion of what's going on. If uh, those of you that have been in it would understand, but uh, uh, once you get into the pavement preservation mode and want to get a real full picture of where it's at, if you don't devote five years worth of funding and five years worth of uh, uh, studying it to it, you're, you may not get the full effect. You know, you've got some of these treatments that are going to uh, run their course uh, of effectiveness within uh, five to seven years. So at the end of a five-year investment, you're going to have a pretty good idea of where you're at. Um, and uh, so... Um, with that, you know, let's just jump on in so you can take that down, Matt, or can I close it? Yep, I close it. Go. You can just close it on your uh, screen. Yep, yep, I got it. Okay. So yesterday, uh, we had a little bit of a brief intro to uh, paper preservation techniques by both uh, uh, Jason Dietz and Sam Gregory. But just these first couple slides are just going to kind of jump in and refresh. And some of you that might have not been with them. Uh, what is microsurfacing? Well, it's a, it's a mixture of a polymer modified, and that's important, a polymer modified asphalt emulsion, a dense graded aggregate. Uh, if you were to pick up a handful of that aggregate, you'd think most of it was dust. There's nothing in this gradation of stone any bigger than a fingernail, okay? And you've got a lot of uh, 100 and 200 mesh materials in there. Uh, but you're going to mix that with some mineral filler, whether it's a hydrated lime or a Portland seam, just to help with the, uh, the setting characteristics of it. You're going to blend some potable water and some other additives, depending on weather uh, condition. Um, purposes, as opposed to maybe a regular slurry seal, certainly, and, and maybe a, uh, some or other pavement preservation treatments. Uh, you do have some rut filling and leveling, minor leveling capabilities with microsurfacing. We'll talk about that. Uh, you can see it's a thin treatment as it's being applied, so we're going to reduce the raveling of the existing surface. And as time goes on, uh, no matter what the gradation of stone and the texture that you place behind the paver, uh, we're going to leave a uh, moderately textured surface that will smooth out to a degree uh, under track as time goes on. You're obviously going to seal the pavement surface as well as some small cracks. But I want to really caution you on using the microsurfacing as your crack repair treatment. Uh, I always say that if you have a cr uh, cracking problem, treat it like a cracking problem with the materials and products that, uh, uh, that are out there for that. And let prep stage for the microsurfacing application. Uh, it's generally used on higher volumes uh, as opposed to a slurry seal. Maybe we'll have... Uh, uh, the opportunity to use that on some lower volume roads. Uh, as I mentioned, the emulsion that's always used in microsurfacing is always polymer modified. We'll discuss what type of rutting is uh, effectively taken care of with, uh, with the microsurfacing as we get into this thing. Uh, but consolidation rutting or top-down type of rutting, if you have a, a firm uh, road bed or, or, or your uh, intermediate layers or, or in good shape. Uh, if you've just got some surface rutting going on, there's a chance that uh, this microsurfacing can uh, go a long way toward leveling and keeping that road in good profile. Careful to use it uh, properly. If you're seeing shoving and rutting at intersections or bus stops, that, that's the kind of deformation that's really not designed for this stuff to, to take care of. Uh, it's quicker drying than slurry seal. Typically, uh, the microsurfacing is going to be ready for traffic in one hour. Uh, I do want to point out, I listened to Sam talk yesterday where he pointed out the fact that if the materials do not dry in an hour, he recommended removing and replacing the material. And I just want to correct that if I can. Uh, just because a microsurfacing does not dry within that one hour uh, required time, it doesn't necessarily mean there's anything structurally wrong with the seal. So, 
uh, there's some things that can affect it, uh, but uh, if it doesn't dry within that one hour time, it does not mean you have a bad material. Okay. Uh, with the micro surfacing, you're able to place it in multiple lifts where some of these other treatments we talk about are single layer uh, applications. Um, we'll see in a second here about different gradations of rock and you can use whichever gradation of rock on the top layer to get whatever ride texture you use. But just, just a, a hint that uh, more than a couple of layers of micro being placed uh, cost effectively, you can probably get into thin lift asphalts, honestly, for the same price. So be careful and don't overdo it with the microservicing. You can put it down as many lifts as you want, but cost wise, uh, it's going to be uh, uh, eventually cost prohibitive. You know, we talk about uh, the different gradations of stone. You'll hear people talk about, well, I want to, I want some of that type B slurry or some of that type B microsurfacing. All they're referring to is the aggregate size. Again, these are all number 10 rock dust gradations, uh, type A, type B, or type C. You know, you might hear them sometimes referred to as type one, two, and three. Uh, but you can see just graphically here what the different textures are uh, for, the, uh, for these type of, uh, of aggregate gradations. And I mentioned, you know, the combination treatments where if you want to do a little bit of minor leveling with the microsurfacing, we might want to think about putting the first coat down with a type C. And we have quite a few customers that will use either the type A or type B as the, as the final ride surface, just, just a little smoother, a little quieter. Uh, but you've got combination op opportunities with this mix. Excuse uh, me, Chuck. Uh, yeah. Don't mean to draw. This is Matthew Bradley. I'm just going to cut your video. You're just keep presenting. We're just getting a little chop on the receiving end. So I'm just going to turn off your camera. Okay, that's fine. I'll take I'll take care of it on my ends. Okay, good deal. Right. Thanks. Is that any better? Okay. Well, let, let's just uh, let's just go in here to get through the best practices part. We're going to assume that you're putting this material down on a proper site that's been selected, proper type of pavement. The project's been bid and awarded. Your mixed design uh, paperwork and materials have been submitted and approved. You've had your pre-construction meeting with all of the uh, contractors, subcontractors. Everybody's responsibilities have been uh, laid out and you've got materials on site and are approved for use and you're ready to go to work. Some things on, on y'all's end uh, that you uh, may want to be on top of and pay attention to during the, during the process. Uh, there's, there's different steps and kind of like a puzzle. They're all important steps. Uh, one thing I'll point out in a second, what uh, you might be interested in when the contractor is working on a pile or staging area. We'll talk about that in just a second. We need to start with a structurally sound room. Uh, doesn't mean that just because you've got a localized pothole, some longitudinal transverse cracking, that that takes the road out of, uh, out of the category of candidate for this mix. Uh, there's different types of surface preparation that you want to get into, uh, whether it's crack sealing or wedge and leveling or deep patching. Uh, traffic control, that's going to change job to job. Uh, we'll get into that. Uh, notification and outreach. I'll tell you this thing that is really, really become a key item that uh, contractors and agencies both need to pay attention to. Uh, you can't over notify people and you can't uh, assure them more uh, about these materials. And we'll talk about that briefly. Uh, we'll take a look at equipment and application. And at the very end, we'll talk about and point out some uh, inspection points and some things that you really need to be up on. So far as the stockpile location, you know, the contractor is going to need a place relatively close to the job uh, to work with. All his materials will be stored there. Uh, it's uh, where he'll recharge all of the equipment before going out to the paving site. Uh, in some ways, similar to an asphalt paving job where they're hauling materials to the paver from an asphalt plant. Um, like to have it on a gravel or some sort of a hard surface to minimize waste. High and dry important, especially uh, through some of the wet summer months. We couldn't get enough or dry enough on the eastern shore of Maryland a few years ago when uh, Superstorm Sandy came through. Uh, that sort of put our staging area and a bunch of equipment underwater for a while. So it, uh, uh, be kind of selective where you're, where you're at. Um, 
nice to be nice neighbors and not disrupt a bunch of people in the neighborhood. Um, access to water is good. We do need to use potable water uh, on a regular basis. Agencies, sometimes we're just buying water from the hydrants from you. Uh, and you might have a, a contractor ask for your assistance if the county or the, uh, the borough or the township has a, uh, a public works yard or a, a vacant lot somewhere that the contractor can use for stockpiling, they may be interested in talking to you. Now, this is something that you will want to have in specifications. Um, if you look in this picture back here in this corner, it's a, a screening plant. The materials are hauled in where the loader is here and run through the screening plant just to ensure proper gradation. Now the stone coming out of that core is probably guaranteed gradation. That doesn't mean that the contract hauler that brought the stuff to you uh, was hauling the same material yesterday. And as you can see here on the shaker screen, you know, there's uh, all sorts of oversized material, two by fours, rip wrap. Um, you know, it could be any any array of materials that uh, that come through that screening plant. So it's very important and a critical add to your specifications. Picture on the right there just shows you know if these materials can make it through and get into the paver. Being such a thin lift overlay, uh, it's not going to take much to uh, to disturb the uh, the surface of the texture. So you really need to have aggregate to get to get this what you want. Prep techniques. I mentioned longitudinal transverse cracking, some random cracking. Um, microsurface itself is not designed to heal moving cracks. So, addition of crack sealing with your microsurfacing will pretty much ensure you a good waterproof seal. Uh, wedge and level, much like you do on some paving jobs. Uh, if the road is structurally sound, you just want to bring the shoulder up a little bit. You can certainly do it that way prior to microsurfacing application. You might have some localized failures that require full depth patch. Be careful with vegetation as well. Um, certainly roads, uh, roadsides that uh, have had grass encroaching over the pavement edge, we've all seen that. Grass growing between the interface crack of the curb and gutter section and the asphalt surface. Um, get as much of that vegetation out as you possibly can. Uh, the surfactants used in these emulsions, if you've seen a paving job or even a microsurfacing job, some that you've seen it, uh, there might be all of a sudden brand new green grass show up a week or two after uh, you place it. Um, the surfactant uh, used in some of these emulsions is really a high grade fertilizer. So, uh, so just be careful and get rid of your, your vegetation. Tree trimming as well. This equipment is the height of at least a tandem sized dump truck. And we have to get right up to uh, the road's edge to get the seal placed properly. So if you've got a tree canopy with uh, uh, say less than 12 feet clearance from ground to tree limbs, you might want to consider your uh, tree trimming operations ahead. Pavement marking eradications. These materials don't stick well to thick, slick pavement markings. Thermoplastic markings, tape markings, even some latex paint that has uh, a lot of glass bead reflective media in it. Uh, these type of markings need to be eradicated and removed to probably 75, 80 percent uh, just to have a surface texture for this microsurfacing to grab to. I had a question the other day, well I understand you got to remove it, but can you put thermoplastic markings back on top of uh, microsurfacing? And absolutely yes. Uh, the textured surface of the micro will grab the thermo very, very well. However, tape markings uh, sometimes don't perform quite as well. We've had some luck with them in recent years, but uh, uh, tape markings do not perform super well on top of microsurfacing. Protect your utilities, your water valves, your gas valves, your manholes, cover them up with some roofing felt or some plastic just to uh, uh, be able to locate them and, and uh, uncover them when the, when the job is dry enough for traffic and you'll have a clean utility to locate. Traffic control is gonna change day to day whether it's flaggers or pilot vehicles, you know, an extended lane closure, uh, but use your proper signage and leave a clear message when, uh, when you're setting up your traffic control and your work zones. 
you know, you're going to be in divided highways up here on the top left where you have uh, exit ramps and on ramps trying to get into the work zone. Uh, be mindful of that and set up your traffic control accordingly. Top right is a county road, two lane road uh, with limited access coming in from side roads and a few residences. Typically a pilot vehicle uh, is a good option right there just to have per people parade through site through your uh, with your pilot vehicle leading the way. Uh, you know, in the bottom left, you know, you've got a multi-lane situation where the outside lanes have been paved. Contractor now is working on the center part of it. So he's got a nice safe work zone combed off uh, uh, for his men to get done what needs to be done. I mentioned clear message. You know, this is a job that was right down the road from my house and it took this company about a month and a half to pave a mile and a half section of the road. And then when they finally got around to painting it on a Saturday morning, clear message here where you got, uh, you know, line painting ahead, keep left with the arrow putting everybody into the right hand lane. So there was brand new paint being scattered all over this asphalt job and just, just leave clear messages. It's uh, easier uh, on the traveling public and a heck of a lot safer and roads busier than that. I mentioned the outreach and communication. You know, that, that, that has become a huge thing. Uh, we work in a lot of uh, residential areas, a lot of municipal situations. And actually, uh, three years ago, I hired somebody to do nothing but communication and lead our outreach program. We've hired, uh, we have rented plenty of uh, school libraries, local fire halls, getting in touch with uh, the residents. We'll send out notices. Uh, we'll work through you guys, the agencies, to assemble some of these HOAs. You all know who the problem HOAs are in your areas, and, and the contractor is going to lean on you for that information. Because um, all those HOAs have got a Facebook page or a community newsletter. We'll try to get something out on Facebook. We'll add a, put a, put a blurb in their newsletter. I'll show you something in a second that's really, really worked well in some of these town hall meetings. But certainly the door-to-door -door flyers and door hangers, variable message boards on roads, multi-lane roads, or uh, uh, a night paving job, for instance, pre-warning. Uh, it's a good idea to have progress meetings as you're going. You know, keep everybody up to speed with what's going on, keeping in touch. You can't over-communicate. In the top left here uh, is actually a website that our company has built and we will show it to different HOAs. Um, slurry seal in your neighborhood, what to expect. And we'll walk them through the whole stages from the road selection. This is the amount of patching and crack sealing we're gonna do right on through the prep work and vegetation removal and application, drying times, where to park your cars and everything. So, uh, if you want to look at it, I believe it's neighborhoodslurry.com. Uh, it's a good one. And if you can't find it there, get in touch with me and I'll hook you up. But just, you know, door hangers, uh, notification on roadways, the bottom right, the notice of street resurfacing that are uh, typically put in the, uh, the flag on somebody's mailbox notifying them. Something that we, we have done here, if you know, parking sign has got in the top end of it here, the international symbols for no parking, no entry, uh, no traffic. There's plenty of areas that will end up working sometimes where English is not the predominant language in the household. So we have actually gone as far as translate these, these uh, notices that are handed out, but certainly the, uh, uh, the no parking signs with, with these symbols showing has, uh, has helped out. So just something to keep in mind. <clears throat> so we talked about all this stuff getting ready to go. Now, what is a microsurfacing paper? Well, it's a dump truck. It's a portable asphalt plant. It's an asphalt paver. And to some extent, it's a roller. Everything combined all in one package. Now we'll see this in motion in a few minutes, but this is what we'll refer to as a continuous run paver, a continuous run operation. The paver itself stays on the project, much like your hot mix asphalt paver will. And we'll have a series of these nurse trucks or support vehicles going to that stockyard and bringing materials back and replenishing this paver and feeding it on the run. It's called continuous run 
theoretically, if you're on a long enough stretch of road and you have enough of these support vehicles and you're close enough to your stop pile, um, we won't have to stop this paver. Just like your regular paver, every time you stop, you have a construction joint. So the more that we can minimize construction joints, so they, they can be, they could be constructed and work very well, but uh, uh, aesthetically and sometimes functionally, uh, the more you can do to eliminate those uh, uh, startup joints will help you out. For some of the smaller work, maybe some of the township work and uh, residential work, cul-de-sacs and the like, uh, it might be advisable to use some of the truck mount pavers. They're much more maneuverable. Uh, the same philosophy, the same uh, mechanism are going to go into the mixing and laying of materials. Just a smaller unit uh, will help out with productivity in some of the smaller, smaller jobs. Now here I want to just play this video, and Matt, I hope it works well for us. Um, as I mentioned, we got this nurse truck here that's going to bring materials to this paver. You got all your materials on board, your aggregate, you have your potable water on one side, your asphalt emulsion is on the other side. They're all being transferred to the paver as he's in motion, okay? We'll take a look at it. All right, you see he's, uh, he's on the run. All these materials are being transferred, the stone via a flow boy stone belt into the hopper here that goes up this chute and into the mixing or the, uh, the holding part back up in here. Your fluids are transferred to saddle tanks here. You've got your mineral filler, your Portland cement or hydrated lime up top that's, that's being added as needed. Typically a small percentage, 3% by weight of the aggregate, okay? You have your spreader box being behind the machine here. And I don't want to try to stop this thing because I stopped it and froze everything before, but your material is being mixed and laid on the back end here into this spreader box, set up at uh, whatever width you want. We like to have these stains on the existing line if possible. But that box can go up to 14 feet wide. Here's your operator up here taking a look that's an important thing he's watching right there for you guys. These machines have onboard diagnostics that can monitor his application rate, how much materials are being through put that machine. And that's something you can ask him at any one given point, what are our application rates today? Okay. You can see it's a very thin type of an application, very durable. He's making some minor adjustments to that spreader box, making sure his application rates are, uh, or what you were buying from him. And uh, that's pretty much it. You know, the machine moves along at a decent clip, you know, a good walk pace. So you can cover a lot of ground in today's time. There are some limitations on temperatures, okay? Um, your application temperatures, we're dealing with an emulsion. Uh, it already has water in it. We don't want to put it on a surface that has puddled water on it. If you have a rain overnight and you got a few standing puddles uh, and you know the weather's gonna dry out pretty quickly, you can shove that water out of the puddles, a front mount power broom or something, uh, but uh, you don't wanna be paving on top of a puddle situation. Uh, if the ambient and the surface temps are less than uh, 50 degrees, these materials just aren't, aren't to be placed in this really. Uh, again, you're dealing with an emulsion that needs some uh, heat in the pavement and some ambient heat to, uh, to dry, even though the chemical reaction in the microsurfacing, um, it is sensitive to temperatures less than 50 degrees, except in unless uh, this time of year we're seeing it and in the early spring, if you have a temperature this morning of 40 degrees, but the forecast high is going to be above 60, it's okay to go ahead and go to work. Uh, the materials are going to get plenty of heat in the pavement and, and ambient uh, later on in the day. You'll be, you'll be good. The biggest thing I'm afraid of here is the bottom bullet uh, is the freezing temperatures. Now we can push the limits of that 40, 50, and 60 degrees and split hair that. But if you've got freezing temperatures expected within 24 hours, uh, please don't place this material. 
Chuck, we've got about 20 minutes left and we do have a couple of questions you'll need to, to grab at the end, just to let you know. Okay, all right, I'm gonna speed up. Rug filling and scratching level is something that uh, is a capability of the uh, microsurfacing that we uh, had talked about. You can do some minor, minor leveling. Uh, if you've got rutting less than a half an inch, your full width box that we just looked at can, uh, can be, the, uh, be the tool to use. We do have a special box for ruts that are a little bit deeper. Now here we talked about consolidation rut. Uh, this customer here in North Carolina decided they wanted to find out what was causing that rut. So they took slabs out of the road. Now, if you can follow my pointer here, uh, the surface is rutted but the interface between the surface layer and the intermediate layer is good and solid. So they figured they had a consolidation rut. Some of those ruts actually got over an inch deep. Uh, we used a, a one half lane wide spreader box, especially designed for this rut filling uh, to, place, uh, to place the material in that rut. It's a good idea to check uh, for level as you're going along, be sure you're getting enough material placed in it. The picture on the left, if you have some minor rutting, less than a half an inch, go to that full width spreader box that they were working with a minute ago, and you can do some leveling with that. But over on the right-hand side, we had some ruts that were in excess of a half an inch deep. You can see the uh, rut filling done uh, one rut at a time. And it's worth mentioning here too, that if you wanna add some additional structural strength to that, now that you've used your microsurfacing for rut filling, if you want, you can put a plant mix asphalt on top of that, okay? Uh, but it's typically applied with a microsurfacing. We mentioned microsurfacing can be placed at night. It's a chemical reaction that sets off the curing. Uh, some things you wanna look for, make sure your uh, utility covers are protected. Keep an eye on the weather. Uh, use some roofing paper. If you're paving a road and the intersecting road is not gonna be paved, Lay out a roll of roofing paper and have a nice sharp straight edge at the intersection. It just looks better. Uh, you can monitor your application rates and the surface temperature or texture. Uh, make sure you have good and clean uh, longitudinal and transverse joints. We want them not to have any buildup uh, and drain properly. Verify your quantities. Um, some non-uniform appearance things that you might see this time of year, uh, discoloration on the mat uh, is, is something that happens. It's just a different drying time between uh, uh, one lane to another sometimes. Uh, again, the emulsions have got to cure out. Uh, so you might end up seeing some discoloration on a mat of a microsurfacing job this time of year. Nothing that's gonna affect the structural integrity of the mix. Keep an eye on your pavement temperatures. Sometimes uh, you might see a little bit more raveling uh, than, is, than is normal, uh, but cool temperatures can be a function of that, as well as an inadequate application rate. If you're putting the material down too thin, uh, some of that rock might want to roll out. So make sure your application rates are right. Putting material down thicker than it's designed to go down may lead to some bleeding or fat spots. So again, keep an eye on your application rates. Tire marks and scuffing uh, might be an issue in the very middle of the summertime, uh, especially in residential areas. Uh, the mix is a little bit tender. So keep an eye on, uh, on that. Uh, addition of this polymer modified emulsion certainly helps with using uh, that scuffing. There's some, if you have uh, materials in gutters or swales or on bridge decks, Mask them maybe with some roofing paper, and if it's necessary, you might get into a power washing situation. But with proper planning, you proper materials used, well maintained equipment, a good crew, results should be pretty much a successful project, regardless of what type of road or traffic load you're dealing with. So let's jump into chip seals. Okay, um, I saw that uh, we had a kind of a mix with some people uh, uh, more familiar with chip seals than microsurfacings, and that's not uncommon. Chips have been the workhorse of our industry forever. But they do have some limitations. They are a thin asphalt or a thin preventive maintenance treatment as well. They're not going to strengthen the existing pavement or increase the load bearing capacity. Uh, 
if you have a rough pavement, it's not going to smooth the rough pavement out. You know, rough and raveling or oxidized is different. If you're riding down the road and spilling coffee in your lap in the morning, putting a chip seal on top of it, it's not going to cushion that ride any. Uh, and it, uh, it's not going to be able to bridge wide cracks that are moving as well. Nor is it a rut filling material. Nor is it going to eliminate the, the need for future maintenance or reconstruction. You know, again, you're talking about a preventive maintenance treatment here. But several benefits, including skid resistance uh, enhancement. Certainly you get uh, a slicker uh, road can, can have some skid resistance added to it and turn it into a much safer road. Minor cracks are okay. Uh, it will extend the serviceable life of a pavement for up to 10 years, properly installed. And it's gonna correct things like raveling, some minor flushing, aged or oxidized pavements, as long as they're structurally sound. We saw this, this uh, chart yesterday, and I think we've established that fog seals, slurry seals, microsurfacings, they live closer here to the top of the curve when pavements are in a little bit better shape. Chip seals may be a little bit more forgiving in that you can go down that curve a little bit longer, uh, but you still have to be within the good and fair range for a chip seal to do what it's designed to do. It's not a rehab material. Uh, it's still a preventive maintenance material, but you can use it a little bit further down the deterioration curve than, uh, than some of your other thin treatments. Uh, the functions of a good uh, aggregate that you select uh, is going to resist the traffic abrasion. If it's seated properly, it's not going to dislodge under normal traffic loads. And again, it will certainly improve uh, the surface friction and the safety. The gradation of the stone is important. Uh, single size aggregates uh, are preferred. Uh, angular or cubicle is much better, uh, more surface area for the emulsion to grab to than a flat or a round uh, type of an aggregate. Clean, uh, Sam talked about it yesterday. Uh, cleaned uh, rock free of dust uh, will uh, lend itself to better adhesion. Uh, softer the rock you have, the more absorptive it's going to be, and the more binder that's going to be required uh, to get that material to lock in. So good quality aggregate is, is a key component to successful chip seal jobs. A couple different types of asphalt binders that you use. Um, uh, the functions of the asphalt binder that you're using, uh, we need one that's going to be uh, quality enough to adhere to the aggregate, the clean aggregate that we're using. Uh, the emulsion uh, or the binder will be able to seal minor cracks and provide that waterproof seal that we're talking about. You need it to be fluid, but yet viscous and thick enough that it's not gonna run off the road behind the distributor here. Uh, we want it to be able to develop adhesion quickly. And we don't want it to be such that it's uh, thick enough or uh, viscous enough that it's going to be a bleeding surface, okay? Now we're going to use different, whether it's a hot AC here, the hot asphalt cement characteristics where uh, with the hot AC, there's little to no curing period. Uh, you do have a quicker return to traffic. And sometimes using the hot AC as your binder and utilizing a pre-coated aggregate, it can make for a pretty good looking job. You know, it's not a gray surface treatment at that point you're looking at a darker surface to start with. Disadvantages using a hot AC binder though, you need to, it, it needs to be applied in warmer temperatures than your typical emulsions that are, that are uh, predominant in this type of application. Uh, it is very sensitive to moisture in the aggregate. And if you're utilizing that pre-coated aggregate we talked about, there is a cost to that. So there's a little bit more of a built-in cost when using the hot AC binders. Whereas on a uh, emulsified asphalt, you can apply them at lower temperatures. They're not quite as sensitive to moisture in the aggregates. And you don't need to use the pre-coated aggregates if we get improper embedment with, the, with uh, the asphalt emulsion. You do have a little bit longer cure time when you're using an emulsion uh, on a chip seal. But, uh, uh, but again, it's very advantageous using these materials. About 10 minutes. Okay. 
Uh, we're going to repair all the holes and depression and take care. You know, you've still got to start with a road that's in pretty good shape. Uh, do these repairs six months in advance would be maybe advise, advised. Um, and again, and I'll just move down the line here, sealing cracks is important. Don't rely on these thin treatments to do all your crack sealing for you. Even though chip seal applications are a little more forgiving than the uh, uh, microsurface we talked about, uh, you still need to pay attention to the cracking problem. Vegetation removal and pre-sweeping uh, and protecting utilities, just like your other treatments is important. Ideal conditions, sunny, dry, warm, low humidity, light breeze. Who doesn't like a day like that, you know? Um, no imminent rain. It's a little bit more forgiving than microsurfacing, but uh, you don't want to have a storm uh, approaching you uh, and still try to take, uh, take a chance on letting your emulsion cure uh, in wet weather. The National Center for Pavement Preservation is going to recommend about 60 degrees at rising for your emulsion treatments. And like I said, your higher temperature uh, recommendations when using a hot AC binder uh, for your chip seal application. Uh, we recommend going to 70 degrees and above. Anytime you get up to above 100 degrees or surface temperatures 130 degrees or above, uh, it might inhibit the binder's ability to hold the aggregate and it could just remain softer longer than you want it to. Traffic control is gonna change just like anything else. You know, just, you know use, uh, use the flaggers, properly placed cones, uh, pilot cars on your two lane roads if necessary, uh, changeable message signs, same, same traffic control that's gonna change day to day. Just set up your traffic control as necessary. The equipment that we're gonna use, you're gonna have uh, uh, obviously a distributor, your chip spreader, uh, a truck is gonna feed your spreader. You got a roller pattern that needs to be adhered to and you're gonna need to be sweeping. Uh, I've, I've got this slide ahead of itself, uh, but uh, with the distributor, a thing to keep in mind is uh, what, what's your desired application rate going to be? And so you need to get your uh, uh, asphalt distributor calibrated uh, to make sure that your application rate is being adhered to. Once you know what your application rate is going to be and your width of spray and what your asphalt pump output is, it can all be calibrated to match up with the forward ground speed of the uh, distributor. It's gotta be an insulated tank with your heating and circulating system, obviously spray bar and nozzles, uh, distributor controls and gauges uh, for the operator to keep an eye on. Some of these distributors can go up to 24 feet wide. Uh, you can spray in one foot increments. Uh, nozzles are spaced about four inches apart. Spray bar height is important. Let's keep the spray bar height here at about 12 inches to the point where the tips that you're using are going to get a triple overlap pattern to ensure you know, proper coverage and not corn row uh, spray application. The chip spreaders, uh, obviously the job is to apply the, uh, the cover aggregate over that uh, emulsion seal on the roadway. Uh, a properly calibrated uh, chip seal spreader is going to apply a uniform rate of stone. Uh, it's going to be a uniform rate that's going to save money on the aggregate. We're not, not wasting it with some of these newer machines instead of the uh, drop spreaders that uh, we've, we've all used in years past. And uh, it is an opportunity to increase production, obviously, uh, with the better advancements in equipment. Rubber tired rollers. Uh, minimum 10 to 12 uh, ton moving at about 6 to 10 miles an hour. It's going to orient that aggregate on the flattest side, uh, embed the aggregate in the, in the binder, locking them together. We don't want wobbly tires. You know, obviously that could work against scrubbing the, uh, uh, the, the rock side to side and not embedding. Have, have the same type of uh, uh, pounds per Pounds uh, in each tire, uh, uniform, uniform uh, uh, PSI in each of the tires. Try not to start and stop real quick. Uh, cleaning equipment, uh, different type of self-propelled sweepers, whether it's a vacuum or a rotary or a pickup sweeper. Um, and in some cases where the stone may be dusty, 
you may need to uh, have a water spray system on board. Uh, final sweeping uh, can begin as little as an hour or as long as two hours after the compaction of the aggregate, depending on the cure rate. Uh, you need to have it cured before the, the, the sweeping, the final sweeping is done. You might have to wait till tomorrow morning to do it. Uh, but you can use, again, like I said, kick brooks, pick up, pick up brooms, uh, depending on environmental restrictions. And again, the water might be necessary for dust control. Quickly here, we're gonna jump into some chip seal variations. Uh, single chip seal application with your binder applied, your single size aggregate applied, hit it with your pneumatic tire roller. And you can see as time goes on, the emulsion is changing color and it's curing. Uh, you've got about 70% embedment with your rock there is what you're looking for. And over time, uh, you can see how the embedment increases uh, just after rolling, it gets a little bit thicker. And certainly as time goes on under considerable amounts of traffic, that binder may work its way up to the top. I know we've all seen some uh, uh, roadways that have uh, flushed over time. It might be uh, a cause of an over application of emulsion during construction. So be careful with your application rates. Double chip seals, uh, application of your emulsion, your single size aggregate, you're going to roll that and get everything locked in place. You're going to have a second binder application and follow that up on your double chip seals with a smaller aggregate for your second coat. That'll just help lock everything in. About three minutes. Okay. Hit it with your rubber tire roller. Everything cures. You're good to go. Uh, cape seals. Anybody heard of Cape Seals, okay? It's something that's gaining more and more popularity out there. It allows us to take a road that's in a little bit rougher shape than normal. Uh, we're gonna put a single chip seal down. We're gonna roll it as well, get your good embedment. We're gonna broom it and sweep it just like normal. And then I like to wait about a week to 10 days later, we'll come in with an application of a slurry seal or a microsurfacing to give it that nice black smoother look and ride on top. It locks the chip seal aggregate in. And you can probably gain a life expectancy between the two applications of up to, you know, I've seen them go 10 to 12 years. So it's, it's a good treatment to, to keep in mind in your toolbox. Quickly here, I just wanna show you another variation of a chip seal application. There was a job done in the Blue Ridge Parkway, uh, sections in North Carolina and Virginia. They decided that uh, they had some pavement, a whole lot of their inventory pavement was in need of something. Uh, this first contract was about 90 miles of the parkway was done. And over the course of the last three years, probably 350 miles of the Blue Ridge Parkway has been done this way. It's a single, shot surface treatment. And after the single shot surface treatment was placed and repeatedly swept to get rid of all the loose aggregates, you know, you have a lot of motorcycle traffic on the Blue Ridge Parkway. And so we needed to have a good locked in mat that was safe for uh, motorcycle riders in this time of year, the leaf poppers and everything else. Uh, good compaction and you notice on this, particular job, they requested and required a steel wheel roller to even further embed the rock. Use a hard enough rock and you shouldn't fracture the rock with, uh, with a steel wheel roller. Fog seal applied to it on the run afterwards and it just leaves a very good surface, very beautiful surface with the uh, fog seal acting as something to lock in the surface and keep that road in good shape for years to come. Now you're gonna be responsible for accepting and inspecting these jobs. And I can't stress the importance of good oversight on a project. Uh, all these things that we've talked about from material inspection, the placement, uh, look at your workmanship, the, what's the quality of the finished product? Is it what you were hoping for? Stay current with your sampling and testing. Um, and I can, just can't stress the, the importance of good quality. So, I hate to have to have run through that so quickly here at the end, but uh, 
uh, but the inspection part of this and oversight is, is critical to inf enforcing the specifications that you went long and hard to, uh, to put in place. So with that, I'm, I'm about done, Matt. I'm sorry for going over and I'm hoping we can get to some of these questions. That's all right. Well, I don't think we're gonna have time for, for questions, uh, but uh, Jason Dietz has been trying to field some of them as we went along. Uh, oh, okay. I've, I've also uh, uh, linked, uh, and, and folks have been answering each other's questions a little bit, which is also, <laughs> okay. uh, but I've also linked them to the roadresources.org site for uh, uh, some of the, so if anybody hasn't seen that, definitely click on that link. Uh, a lot of your questions in the chat pod, I know from experience, are answered in some of those recorded webinars, and I would really encourage you to go there and have a look. Uh, Chuck, thanks so much for uh, for all that content today, and uh, I think Matthew, you're going to direct folks where to go next. Yes, 